Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Nicole Smith out of Slack Chiropractic in Burlington, Mass. I am a prenatal and pediatric chiropractor. Here with me today is Dr. Linda Slack and Julie Brill, and I'm so excited to bring the two of these uh, professionals together to talk about what a tongue tie is and how it can affect your baby and what you're able to do about it. So to get started, Dr. Linda, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Dr. Linda Slack, and I've been practicing in Burlington, Mass. with my husband for the past 34 years, and now Dr. Nicole Smith has joined our practice with us, um, a pediatric and neurodevelopmental chiropractic specialist, and I also am on the Academy and the Council for the International Chiropractic Association, Pediatric Association, which is the premier chiropractic pediatric association in the world. And I'm also an instructor for them, so I teach and uh, lecture all over the world. And Julie? Hi, um, I'm Julie Brill. I'm an IBCLC in private practice in Bedford, Mass. Um, I've been working with families in the childbearing year since 1992. Um, I'm also a childbirth educator and a labor doula, and I train childbirth educators and labor doulas. Um, and I'm the author of a doula anthology called Round the Circle. Awesome. So both Dr. Linda and Julie have done a lot of work in their practices with babies with tongue tie, families who have children with tongue tie. So we wanted to come together today and share some of the information with you and elaborate on the importance of this information and being educated on what a tie is. So to start, um, could you explain to us what are ties? Go ahead, Julie. Oh, sure. Um, so a tie is an oral restriction um, in a baby or in a person's mouth um, that keeps them from having proper function. So a person could have a tie under their tongue, under um, either or both lips, um, and there are also buckle ties in um, four locations. Um, and so you can have one or multiple ties in your mouth. And Dr. Linda, how, how would you say these ties affect you know, the baby with breastfeeding or development? Yeah, so the ties, um, let's go back actually to the fetal development, okay? So in, in the womb at about 14 to 16 weeks, those, those ties or those frenulum are supposed to go undergo something that we call apoptosis, meaning that they retract and then they become nor like uh, thinner so that, especially like with the tongue, for example, the tongue will then be able to raise to the roof of the mouth onto the palate and to then from that time on begin to shape that palate properly for the, the fetus in the womb. And what happens during that time of apoptosis is it doesn't occur. So the tongue stays down to the floor of the mouth and isn't able to lift appropriately. So from that period of time, what people don't really realize is that that tongue is not functioning properly from the very, very beginning, um, even before the infant's born. So by the time they are born, they've had this issue and dysfunction for a very, very long time, many months. Yeah, I think that's so important. People will say, my baby's three days old or my baby's four days old. But of course, you know, we're going back and looking at fetal gestation. They've had that tongue in, with impaired movement for months. Absolutely. And Julie, being an IBCLC, because you work with a lot of moms and you work with different types of situations with lactation and breastfeeding, what are some of the common things that moms come to you for or complaints or how is it affecting their breastfeeding experience? Um, right, so the main things that we see with tongue ties impacting breastfeeding is pain for the mom, nipple pain and nipple damage, um, and also babies who are unable to latch properly and so can't transfer well, sometimes they can't latch at all. And um, I know a lot of times the it's usually the dentist who finds the tongue tie or the lip tie. And then they'll recommend that the baby go and see a lactation consultant and a chiropractor. Um, can you touch upon a little bit of what is the desired protocol or how should, you know, a mom who just found out her child has a lip or tongue tie, what should they do? Right. So um, hopefully they're working with a body worker and an IBCLC before the release. Um, as an IBCLC, I can help them protect their production, their milk production, and we can look at how to feed the baby that might be at the breast or not. Um, and then 
uh, start to work on oral exercises. So a lot of times people will think that if they can get the tie release, they're gonna get the solution, but really all that's doing is changing the structure. We need to change the function of the, tie, of the tongue. And so if they just have the release, the baby doesn't know that their tongue can do anything different. Um, so ideally we're working with exercises um, and feeding before they even get released and, and body work, of course. So Dr. Linda, um, touching upon body work, which chiropractic is a form of body work, and we see so many tongue-tie babies in our practice, and I've been able to sit in with you as you explain what's going on with the child, with the ties, and going over the fascia system. So can you elaborate on the importance of having that pre-body work in chiropractic care? Sure. So first of all, the the tongue is under control of the central nervous system or the nervous system. So as chiropractors and as a, and a chiropractor is unique in the way that we are looking at the functioning of the nervous system, which affects the function of the tongue, the ability to suck, swallow, and breathe. And oftentimes we um, see infants who, have, who are compromised through the birth process, even in the best birth possible, they could um, coming through the birth canal is stressful. And we often find stress and tension and pressure way up here at the upper neck and the base of the skull. So um, when, that, when that upper neck is not moving properly, the, the infant may be stuck in flexion, they may not be able to extend their head or they may be stuck and not be able to rotate equally to each side. That usually is an indication that there's something stuck and not functioning and it's putting pressure onto those nerves, especially the cranial nerves, which are those nerves that go out to allow and give function, full function for the tongue. Then the other thing is, is that the reason for doing work, body work before the release is to get everything relaxed around the jaw, all the muscles inside and outside of the mouth to do some cranial work to get, make sure that everything's flowing properly within the cranial system so that everything's relaxed. And what the dentists say is that relaxes the muscles so that when they do the actual release, they can get a deeper release and less chance of having a reattachment following that. And then once they release the tongue, as Julie alluded to, the, the, you know, all of a sudden the tongue is free. It can move better, um, but, the, but the infant's like, whoa, what just happened here? And so we need to know that that frenulum is part of the fascial system. Now the fascia is, is the tissue that sits right underneath the skin. It connects to everywhere from head to toe and it intertwines between the organ systems. So it connects everything in the body. And so we take a taut tight tissue and release it and then we're affecting the whole entire fascial system has to readjust. So in the process of that, we want to make sure, number one, that there aren't any fascial constraints anywhere else in the body. And that's why we do craniosacral therapy and chiropractic. And then we also want to make sure that there's no imbalance within the muscle system. So one of the other things that I see when that tongue is released, there's a little bone under here that the tongue connects to. It's the only free floating bone in the body. It's called the hyoid bone. And when we release that tongue, this bone goes woo, like all over the place. And if it's out of position, it's going to create asymmetry in the tongue as well. So there's so much more than just that, that we need to address and look at besides just the tongue release. The yeah, exactly. If you think about the way that a baby wants to come to the breast or anybody wants to swallow, we want to do this. We never tuck our chin and do a big drink, right? So if the baby is stuck like this, um, they're, they're never going to be able to get to the breast in a way that's going to be comfortable for them. They really need to be able to come up like this. Um, so tongue tie or no tongue tie, a lot of babies come through the birth process and they're, they're in flexion like that. We need them in extension. So would you say, Julie, with after a baby has had a release, um, they almost have to be retrained on how to breastfeed or how to get a proper latch? Or what is the significance of them coming back to see you after the release? Right. So it's, it's the 
baby and also the parent who need to kind of readjust. So the baby needs to learn how to use their new tongue and their new lip if the lip was released and they weren't able to do the flanging at the breast that makes breastfeeding so much easier for them and more comfortable for the parent. Um, so we need to help them learn what their tongue can do, keep flanging the lip until the baby one day realizes they can do that on their own. Um, but then also a lot of parents are helping the baby to eat, really doing the baby's job and they don't even realize it. So it could be something as simple as the mom doing breast compressions to help the milk come out because the baby needed that help pre-release. Mm -hmm. And now post-release she does it because she just thinks that's what breastfeeding is. And so to help her remember, oh, that's the baby's job. Um, so sometimes it's a simple thing, but people don't even realize they're still doing it. Absolutely. So I know a lot of times um, a baby will have a release, but then they need to go back and get a revision done. Yeah. Would you, can you, either one of you comment on the importance of continuing with both types of care before the revision and after the revision, even though they already did it for the original release? I think in my practice, I see babies oftentimes after they've had a release and they didn't have any care either by the by a lactation consultant or a body worker before or after so oftentimes parents you know are having difficulty the mom's having difficulty with breastfeeding from the very beginning and and rushes off right to the dental provider or the ENT and they have um, the release performed while they're there because it's convenient and then they, they, they aren't told or they don't do that type of work. And then moms can, may continue to, it may work and they may have 100% success just like that. But oftentimes it doesn't. And then I'll see the baby after reattachment. Or the other reason is because the parents weren't given the proper uh, stretching and exercises to do. And I think that's one of the things I know about Julie is that she is one of the only IBCLCs I know that actually gives a really good set of pre-exercises and posts to do for the parents. Yeah, I think when people are able to start doing those releases pre-release, I mean the exercises pre-release, they um, are so much more comfortable in the baby's mouth after the release. Um, and the baby doesn't associate the exercises with the release. It's just something that's been part of their lives. Um, so I agree. If we can get the people doing those exercises pre-release, it makes a really big difference. Um, and to what you were saying, Dr. Nicole, if um, the baby goes in for a second release, we want to make sure that they don't need a third release. So really looking at what caused that reattachment in the first place so that it doesn't happen another time. Nobody wants to keep going back for that. Awesome. Um, we had another question that came up that someone was wondering, does it impact or, or is there a need to rush? Like, will this, the sooner you do a release change the outcome? Do you need to do it right away? I know some moms worry that maybe they didn't get to it soon enough. Right. I think it's much better to take a week or, you know, however long it takes, two weeks to be able to get everything in a line before going in for that release. Because what people really want is they want a better outcome and you get that faster with the preparation pre-release than just rushing to the release. Um, it doesn't get you to where you're trying to go faster, unfortunately. It'd be nice if it were that simple. It'd be great, but on age-wise, I think that if an, an infants that I've seen whose parents were either on the fence about wondering to do it or not, or they've been, got one, doc, one provider told them there was no tie and another provider said, yes, there are ties. And so the parents wavered a long time. And I've seen babies at 10 months. There's a window where it's really difficult because especially when they start to have teeth, <laughs> um, really, really hard to get in there and do the stretches at that time. So in that respect, the earlier, the better, but not to like you, like Julie said, you do not have to rush and do it. You've got, it's better if you take the time to do the procedure. And I know we all want everything to be like right, right away, but it, it, it's a process and it takes time and you want to do it right so that you have the best outcome for the baby. Definitely. So Dr. Linda, you made a comment about how you know, one professional might say there is a tie and one might say there isn't. What is a way for a mom to, if she suspects that her child might have a tongue or a lip tie, how can she go about finding the right providers or the right professionals? And what kind of questions should she ask? 
So um, I think that the very first provider that the mom should reach out to is an IBCLC. And, but when she calls the IBCLC, she should ask them if they are trained in taking care of infants with ties and what their experience is. How many babies have they seen? And I, I think that they should do their homework and their research or, or ask friends, family, whoever, find that person. And the other thing is that they should stick with that one individual because the other thing that I see in practice um, is that a parent will come in and they'll tell me, like I had a mom of twins yesterday, that they've seen several different lactation consultants. And, you know, it's, it's just like um, anybody who has an injury or a health problem and they go from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor. And, and that's of no help because they're not getting the correct care. So they need to find someone who is experienced, like Julie, and stick with them and follow care through with them and, and, and have that trust. And, and I think that they do that because they're so frantic. They want it corrected, as Julie said, right away today. <laughs> and um, I think they need to, if we can help them to understand that it's going to be okay, we're going to get through this. So you got to work together and, and it's just not like a one and done. Julie, did you want to add to that or just pretty congruent? That was great. Yeah. Okay. That's a good answer. <laughs> and then, so one question I've always kind of had is how soon after a revision or a tie procedure should they come and see either of you? Um, so usually 48 to 72 hours is a good time to come back and see an IBCLC again. I'm usually checking in with people day of um, or early the next day. Um, but um, usually within two or three days, we're ready to start addressing those compensations that we don't need anymore. And I usually suggest that they come in the day after the release, ideally. Nice. Perfect. Um, let me see here. I want to see if we have any other questions that I haven't gotten to touch upon with you guys yet. So... Julie, this question is more directed for you, but there's a lot of different types of lactation consultants out there um, that you have, you know, ones that are in hospitals that are nurses, and then you have the IBCLCs. Can you just elaborate a little bit on the difference between the different types of lactation consultants and who tends to have or who may have specific training for tongue ties? Sure. Um, I mean, it's definitely confusing out there. Lactation consultant isn't a trademark term, so anybody can, you can be a lactation consultant, anybody can be a lactation consultant and use that term. Um, a lot of times when people are in the hospital or they're in their pediatric practice and someone is referred to as a lactation consultant, they're actually a CLC and not an IBCLC. And CLCs are certified lactation counselors. They've done a week long training. Um, so it's very different than being a clinician, which is what we are as IBCLCs, International Board Certified Lactation Consultants. Um, so we have um, hundreds of hours of training. We sit an International Board Certified exam, um, 14 college credits. So it's just a different um, level of training. Um, so if people are checking to see who they're actually working with, if they have a complicated situation like a tongue tie. So for simple things, you know, there's lots of help for breastfeeding, but tongue tie can be more complicated. And then even within IBCLCs, um, you can take the board exam and become an IBCLC knowing very little about tongue tie. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of questions on the exam about it. Um, so in order to really be able to help babies with ties, you need to have taken additional training. So they can ask people what that additional training is and, and how comfortable they feel working with babies who have ties, what their experience is. Absolutely. And then Dr. Linda, I kind of have the same question. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I was going to say the same. I was going to say I have a really, so yeah. a similar question for you is, you know, you have general family chiropractors, but then there's also this whole option of chiropractors who are certified through the International Chiropractic Pediatric Association. Can you talk a little bit about what the difference is between going to see an ICPA chiropractor or regular chiropractor and how to know who has experience with tongue tie? Absolutely. So 
Um, an ICPA trained chiropractor has gone through a rigorous course of um, 120 hours of study, and then they do um, in-office research to um, lead them to take a very rigorous examination to get certified as a chiropractic pediatric chiropractor. And then they can also go on for another an additional 200 hours and become a diplomate in pediatrics. So um, there's also a cer separate certification for what we call Webster technique. Most people know what that is. It's um, a technique that was developed years ago. I, I am fortunate to have been a student of Dr. Webster. Um, he developed this technique that helps um, women in pregnancy. So very, very well known through, throughout the world actually, which is really wonderful. But um, when I tell people when they call a chiropractor that first of all, they wanna look for maybe those credentials, which is CACCP at the end of their name or go to the International Chiropractic Pediatric Association's website, icpaforkids.com and look for not only, you can be listed on that website just because you paid your dues and you may not be a certified pediatric chiropractor, but look for those credentials behind the chiropractor's name in the area that you live in and you should be able to find somebody who's fully qualified. And same thing as I said with, um, any kind of provider is like call the office and say, how many children does the doctor see? How many infants do they see every week in practice? And if they say one or two versus hundreds, <laughs> you've got your answer right there. You know somebody who's qualified or not. Absolutely. So one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this up and have the both of you explain the different levels of your professions is not to say that who someone is seeing right now may not be good or they might not be great for what they need, but there are different things to look for when looking for a provider and there's questions to ask. And even if you are seeing, let's say you see a chiropractor who's not necessarily an ICPA certified chiropractor, at least it's something you can ask them and talk to them about. And if they you know, are able to send you in a certain direction or help you in a certain way. It's just extra knowledge for the parents to have and just more resources for you to be able to have in your belt. Um, but again, it's not to say that there's a right or wrong or that your practitioner or who you're working with is not the correct person to be with. Yeah. And just on that note, there are many chiropractors, for example, who've been in practice as many years as me, and they've seen lots of families, lots of children all through their careers, and they're just as qualified, even though they don't have that specific certification. They have it through ex years and years of experience. Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the other questions I want to ask you is, with is there a certain um, like pre and pro pre and post protocol. Like if you had to simplify what ideally you would like to see the baby go through with care with both the IBCLC and a chiropractor, what would be your recommendations? Either one of you. Okay, I'll start. Um, I think that that's a great question because what people don't realize is that a tongue tie is a tongue tie is a tongue tie, but every baby is different. And so we can give general recommendations, like before the release, um, most on average, um, a baby will see for a couple of weeks before that release, that, that makes me feel comfortable, comfortable. But if you have an infant who has had a really traumatic birth and, um, and was, and there's uh, maybe even they have a fracture or something else going on. And, and like I saw twins yesterday and one was breech and one was head down. And the breech baby was born with a fractured femur because that, that's how intense the, the birth process was to, to birth those babies. And so she is showing way more, <clears throat> excuse me, fascial strain post release than her sister. So I imagine that it's going to take more care <clears throat> post for her than, than her sister, even they're, though they're identical twins, the amount of care needed is going to be different. So when I look at any infant, child, even adult, I, I, ha I take that approach that this is a unique individual. We have to look at their history, their function, 
all over and to, to really put that together and make that determination of what care should be. And sometimes my recommendations are too long, sometimes they're too short, and we can adjust them as we go through care, but really, really important to look at the whole picture of that, of that person in front of you. It's so easy to say, oh, it's another tongue tie and it should be, and it's gonna be this, but it doesn't work that way because we're all different. Yeah, exactly. I think a lot of parents go online and they're trying to kind of Google what to do for a tongue tie and look for a recipe. And there really, unfortunately, isn't that recipe because every baby is different and every parent is different and often multiple things are going on. So maybe the baby is tied, but also the mom has flat nipples or a history of breast surgery or overproduction, or there can be multiple things going on. And so we have to take each piece of the puzzle and, and work to address it. Um, in an individualized way. And even something as simple as the exercises that we're having parents do with babies, those exercises are not always the same because babies need help with different things depending on where their tightness is, where the strains are, um, what they're doing at the breast. Absolutely. I think that's, both of you worded it perfectly and it is so important for moms. Like you said, Julie, a lot of times they're on Facebook and they're looking for answers and to know that it's not necessarily a cookie cutter process. And right. you know, one baby might heal and adapt a lot faster than another. And again, exactly. People the, are in those Facebook tongue tie groups saying, you know, can you send me the recipe for the exercises? <laughs> can you send me a video? And there isn't a video, you know, for their baby that has to be figured out with professional help. Absolutely. Right. So that was all of the questions I had, but I wanted to open up the floor to the both of you in case there was anything you wanted to make sure that we touched upon or we discussed or that moms who might be view or parents, I should say, who might be viewing um, should know. Sure. I mean, I think one of the important things is that when you're a parent, you're, you're the most invested in your baby and in finding solutions for your baby. So um, sometimes you have to ask and then ask in a different way and then ask somebody else for help. Um, but I work with a lot of parents who have figured out that their baby might be tied, you know, from the internet and have been told that their baby isn't tied. Um, so I think the message is just keep looking for answers until you get answers that make sense to you. A lot of times with pediatricians, they're looking for anterior ties. That is a tie. It's a more obvious tie, a tie that comes um, to the tip of the tongue or close to the tongue. A lot of those babies have heart-shaped tongues. They can't stick their tongue out. It's a very obvious tie. And a lot of time the pediatrician will kind of look and if they don't see that, they'll say that the baby has no tie. But they mean there's no anterior tie. And it's very likely if parents are seeing a lot of these symptoms that aren't resolving, that there could be a tie further back, a posterior tie that the pediatrician can't see just by you know, glimpsing in the baby's mouth. Um, so I think the takeaway is a lot of times when pediatricians say there's no tie, they just mean there's no anterior tie. The posterior ties are the much more common ones. There's been some cell death, as Dr. Linda was talking about, but not enough to have a normal frenulum. So keep, keep looking. If you're out there and you're struggling with breastfeeding, there, there are solutions. Keep looking until you find them. And I think that's important too, because I think that um, the as an IBCLC that we need to to pay attention to both the mom and the infant. I think we talked about this the other night, Dr. Nicole, um, that when it's a relationship between the two. And so um, as I think sometimes we have our, our babies born and we just think that breastfeeding is like a natural thing and it's going to do, everything's going to be rosy and, and then it isn't. And then mom gets really stressed out. And in addition to that, mom's not sleeping at night because baby's only sleeping two or three hours at a time. So we have all these things going on and, and um, we, we need, the moms need to know that they're in the, in the good hands of a good, confident provider that can, you know, that they can trust, that they can work through this relationship. Because sometimes, like I've seen moms who like breastfeeding didn't get going ideally without pain and making it, you know, the wonderful relationship that it should be and the bonding for until four months. Now it takes a lot of rigor to stick through it for that long. But um, I feel, I know that it, how important it is to, to, for the infant to be first of all, in getting breast milk versus formulas, because there aren't many healthy formulas out there, if any. I don't know 
and um, maybe the German ones are a little bit better, but there are chemicals in those formulas that um, are not good for the baby's health. And so, you know, there's times where also where we may, where it doesn't work out and we don't want moms to feel like they're a failure either. So, but we want to give the best assistance and help that we can to, you know, help the parent, the mom to reach their, her goals. Exactly. Nobody should be at home trying to reinvent the wheel on their own. There's definitely help out there and, a, you know, a plan that they can create with a team and then have, you know, something to follow. Absolutely. And Dr. Linda, kind of like what you said and what we had talked about Monday is during this time, our babies are, they're such sponges. So when mom is super stressed, the baby can pick up on that. So do you find that even sometimes after the release, the baby may be capable of properly breastfeeding, but isn't doing it because mom is so stressed and the baby's picking up on that stress? Absolutely. I see that oftentimes, especially um, with moms who may be suffering from postpartum depression, not even really noticing at that. So then that's another collaboration with another team member mm -hmm. that we have to work, work out because it does definitely affect, it'll affect her milk production, her milk uh, quality, um, all of that. And then stress, keep the baby stressed out. So the babies may be, may be functioning well, but they may just become colicky or be screaming all the time, you know, and having trouble latching on because they, they're just so disrupted. What would you say, sorry, as we talk, I'm, you know, I have some of these questions that are coming up, but Julie, with the exercises that you give for moms to do, you had mentioned earlier how doing them before the release will help the baby not to associate that with the procedure. Right. So what are some things parents can do post-release to try and keep those exercises so that the baby's able to do them and they're open to having it done and not resisting? Right. So there's two things that parents are generally doing in the mouth. Post-release, they're doing oral exercises, but they're also doing the elevations or the stretches. Um, and so those are, are two separate things. Babies usually don't mind the oral exercises. They don't love the stretches. Um, so it's two separate things, but um, it's very helpful um, if the parent, as Linda was saying, is relaxed, the, the baby entrains to the parent. So if the parent is in fight or flight, the baby's going to go right there too. Um, sometimes people will sing a song or make a game out of it. Um, movement is really helpful too. If, the, if they're able to bounce or rock the baby, um, you know, playing music. So finding other things to do um, to distract really both of them try to bring them more into a calm place. Absolutely. And so right now with everything that we have going on in our society, a lot of moms are home and they're afraid and they're not wanting to go out. Do either of you have recommendations on what a new mom who may be suspecting a tongue or lip tie could do or what her options are right now with everything that's happening? Right. So I think that the good news with that, at least in the Boston area, is that there's still help in place. Um, you know, if a baby isn't feeling, feeding well, that's really an urgent situation. Um, so there are IBCLCs who are still at work. We're doing a lot of telemedicine um, and it works really well. Um, Dr. Linda's still in her office. The dentists, their offices are closed, but they're coming in to do releases as needed. So it's not something that they have to wait until this pandemic is over um, to address. And I think on that note too, though, that because we are home, one of the beautiful things is for any new mom and any new family, uh, you know, anybody having a new baby in the household with, with other siblings, et cetera, it's kind of a cool time because we don't have anywhere else to go. We don't have other distractions so right. that moms can spend more time skin to skin. Um, the whole family can spend more time bonding with the baby and having just quiet time. There's no other distractions where we're usually we're like running, 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 and we, and we don't know how we're going to do every, all, everything all, all together, but now we have the whole family together. So that's, that, that could be a big plus. I agree. In the long run. Absolutely. You don't have to take the baby in and out of the car. <laughs> None of that. Yeah. So even some uh, of our parents are getting lazy, wanting us, wanting me to come see them at home. <laughs> <laughs> Do you deliver? <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> yeah. 
so as we um, wrap up here, I just want to recap some of the important things. So I'm going to, what I would like to do is have each of you recap your few highlights that you want our viewers to have and to go home with. So for me, the few highlights I want to touch upon is A, it's so important for the parents to stay calm and to know that they're not alone and there's resources out there. B, it's important for them to have a team and a team that will communicate with each other and support the family during this time and be able to look at what's going on from different aspects, but to also stick with that team during this time. Dr. Linda? Um, I think the biggest thing is to reach out for help and not try to, like, to, as I said, as we said, not to look on the internet. Um, be careful of uh, all those pages, the Facebook pages and things like that of other parents saying what worked for them because it's not necessarily going to work for your child and, and um, things that work for one baby aren't gonna work for your baby. So instead ask for who are the good providers out there and the good teams to, to be working with. Um, in addition, I think that for the mom to know just deep in her heart that there is help that that it's not a lost relationship that, that, you know, like she doesn't have to just like be so distressed and distraught that um, things aren't going well and that it's not, and it's not the mom's fault. <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> so, um, uh, you know, moms will come in all the time and ask if I, you know, do you think that this is going to work? And I'm like, absolutely. We, you know, if you wish it to, um, we, you know, we can make it happen. So that is the best thing that I can offer is yeah. just like have the parents, the mom just be totally at ease knowing that she can make it work. Absolutely. And Julie? Um, I think that parents have really good instincts. And I, so I think if you're a parent and you're worried about how your baby is feeding, um, I just would encourage you to keep seeking answers until you get answers that make sense to you. Um, there's a lot of information and misinformation out there about tongue tie, um, but to just keep searching until you find a solution that works for you and your baby. Um, breastfeeding shouldn't hurt. You know, babies should be able to transfer milk at the breast. Um, and if those things aren't happening, the question is, is why? Um, and you need somebody to really be able to help you get to the bottom of, of fixing um, the situation and figuring out why the baby is struggling. Absolutely. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And okay. So what I have here is the contact information for both Slack Chiropractic, where Dr. Linda and I work, as well as Well Pregnancy, where Julie is. So with this here, I just want to encourage anyone who, you know, is concerned about a tongue or lip tie or has questions to reach out to any of us and know that we are here to help you and you are able to see us. And if for any reason we're not the ones who can help you, we will help guide you to someone who can. Um, with that being said, Dr. Linda and Julie, thank you so much for being on and for answering these questions and providing this information for the families that are out there. I know for me, I've really been looking forward to this meeting as I find tongue and lip ties are such a common, it's a hot topic right now and there seems to be an increase in the prevalence of it. So this was super helpful for me and I'm sure our families that are watching would say the same thing. Thank you so much, Dr. Nicole. Thank you, Dr. Nicole.